Yeah. If you have your Bibles, please go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John t- chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to give you one. It really would be our honor to give you, maybe if you've never had a Bible, give you your first Bible. We have them for free out in the lobby at our welcome home area, so please go by there and, and get one of those. And today, we are starting a brand new series that we're calling Miracles. And uh, we, do, we do series preaching at our church, meaning that we take some time to really focus on one specific either topic or one specific thought, and we kind of hang out there for a little bit, and then we move on to something else. And today, we're starting a new series called Miracles, and every year around this time, leading up to the biggest celebration of the year, Easter, which is just four Sundays away, um, uh, every year around this time, we intentionally have a series where we like to focus on Jesus. And here's why. I want to make sure, especially if you're new around here, that you understand this. Because we are a church that is unapologetically all about Jesus. Like that's, that, like that's what we're about. In fact, we have 10 values as a church. And these values answer the question, what makes us uniquely us? And we have 10 of them. And no matter where they are listed, the very first one that is always on the list is Jesus is our message every single time. That is the very first value every single time that you see it. And on our website, we have descriptions of this. By the way, if you come to Grow Track today, I will personally tell you a little bit more about our mission, our vision, and our values, and some other really cool things that I would want to know if I was attending church here. And I would love to invite you to come to Grow Track. But on our website, we actually describe every single value in detail. And here's what it says directly from our website. I wrote this before we even started our church, is that we believe that the church is built on Jesus, by Jesus, and for Jesus. Therefore, the focus should always be on Jesus. He is the focus of the messages we preach, the songs that we sing, and the prayers that we pray. We focus on Jesus because we believe That if people see Jesus for who he is, that they will be captured by his beauty and compelled to devote their life to knowing and following him. We believe people hear enough bad news. Can I get a good amen from the church? So our desire is to always tell good news. The message of Jesus, the gospel, literally means good news. And this good news is the central message of our church. Methods will come and go, yet our message will remain the same. Jesus is our message. You got to understand today that our message is not behavior modification, that our message is not self-help, that our message is not opinion. Our message is, and it always will be, Jesus. So in this series... Uh, We're going to learn more about Jesus by taking a look at the Bible at some of his miracles. Now, we don't know exactly how many miracles Jesus performed when he was on this earth, but we do know that he did a lot. In fact, the fourth book of the New Testament is the Gospel of John. And after he tells this whole eyewitness account of Jesus, and he describes some of the biggest miracles that he has ever done, he ends his whole book with this in John chapter 21, verse 25. It says, there are so many other things that Jesus did. I know I just spent 21 chapters telling you about all the things that Jesus did, but listen, there's so many more things that he did. If they were all written down, each of them one by one, I can't imagine a world big enough to hold such a library of books. But in the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are commonly known as the Gospels, which are the eyewitness account of Jesus' public ministry here on earth, that you'll find in those four books, there are 38 unique miracles of Jesus. But I want to make sure that we understand the point of those miracles, because the point of those miracles was not the actual miracles. The point of the miracles were to point to the person who was performing those miracles, 
In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, it literally tells us the purpose of the miracles is that it was God publicly endorsing Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles. Now, you look at that word in the Greek, the original, it's this word dunamis. It's a, it's a version of that, which is where we get the English word dynamite. It's, it, it's another word for it, it's power. And so it's like this explosive dynamite power, these miracles, wonders, and signs that, that were through him. In other words, that the miracles were to prove that Jesus was who he said he was. That was the point of the miracles that we read in the Bible, was to point to the fact that Jesus was saying, here's who I am, and those miracles showed that that's exactly who he was. That he is not just, that he is God. That he's not just a man, that he is the son of God. That he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. That he is in charge. That he has authority. That he is, in fact, the only one that can say, I am your savior. I am your Messiah. And I am your Lord who you should be following. Like that was the point of those miracles. And here's what we believe. We believe that Jesus, and here's kind of the big idea of this series, that Jesus, he did miracles then, and we're going to talk about these, but Jesus does miracles now. And I just, I just want to just challenge you, church, to raise your faith over the next four to five weeks, because Jesus did miracles then, and Jesus does miracles now. You need to know that we are a church who believes Luke chapter one that says that with God, all things are possible. See, we believe what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God, that he can do, get this, immeasurably more than what we can ask or imagine. And here's what I want to ask our church to do over the next four weeks. Regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, I want you to raise your level of faith. I want you to take it to a whole nother level to believe that what God says that God can do, that what we read in the Bible, it's not just a history book, but it's something that we can experience right now. And just what if God does immeasurably more than what we can think or imagine? What if he does that? Why? Because Jesus did miracles then and he does miracles now. So today... If you're taking notes, which I hope you are, um, I want to start this series by talking about this. I want to start this series by talking about miraculous provision. Miraculous provision. Now, I don't know where your mind goes to, and maybe you think instantly like finances and resources and things like that, but I don't want you to go there. Here's what I want to, like, because provision is literally any area of your life where you need God to provide. And so today, we're going to talk about the fact that not only does he provide, he can miraculously provide. Let's talk about miraculous provision by looking at one of the most famous, well-known miracles of Jesus in the entire Bible, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, how many of you have ever heard of this story, the feeding of the 5,000? Just let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay. Uh, now, this is, the, this is kind of a fun fact, kind of Bible fact, is that this is the only miracle of Jesus outside of the resurrection uh, that you can find in all four Gospels. It's the only one. So I think it's an important one that I think God wants us to learn from. And um, so let's, let's read this from, um, from John account. So it's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, but we're going to read it from John, okay? So John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read this slowly. I'm going to stop every now and then, make sure we all are on the same page of what's actually happening. Okay, it says this, after this, now pause there. Because it's important for us to know the context. By the way, if you're ever reading your Bible and you don't understand, I highly encourage you to read what's before it and read what's after that. It's really helpful to know the full context of what's happening. And so two things had just happened. So one, the disciples had just gotten back from an extended ministry trip. And so they had just been sent out by Jesus and they were doing all types of ministry and they were coming back together and they were tired and they were exhausted. The other thing that just happened is that Jesus had just heard the news of the tragic death and really execution of John the Baptist, who is somebody he was very close to. So you have to understand that when this happened, Jesus 
had just heard some really tragic news, and so he was grieving, and he just really wanted to be alone. So it says, after this, and that's what this was, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. Now, this next sentence kind of gripped me this week, and I'll tell you why. It says, a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So here's what that tells me, that their main motivation for following Jesus wasn't Jesus. Their main motivation for following Jesus was his miracles. In other words, like they were following Jesus because of what they could get from Jesus. Now, I've been wrestling with this detail really all week as I've been preparing. And here's, after wrestling with this, here's a conviction statement and a principle that I think applies to so many different areas of our life. And it's this, like it's impossible to have a close, authentic relationship with someone from whom you're always trying to get something. I think we need to chew on this for a moment, that it's impossible to have a close, authentic relationship with someone from whom you're always trying to get something. Have you ever had somebody in your life that every time they talk to you, they're just trying to get something from you? Like, it's exhausting. I promise you, whoever that person is right now you're thinking of, you're like, you know what? That's my best friend in the world. I love that person. I cannot wait for that person to text and to call and to see me because I love it when they just want something from me at all times. Like that, that's not how we're wired. Like I promise you that person is not the case. And like you can't be close with somebody like that. Why? Because there's always an agenda. Like there's, there's every action, every choice, every conversation. It just has strings attached to it. And as long as those strings aren't met, then all of a sudden that person doesn't want anything to do with you. And I'm telling you, when that's the case, like that makes it really hard. Now, this principle can apply to so many different areas of our life. It can apply to our relationships. It can apply to our friendships. It can apply to our marriage. Listen, this principle applies to dating. It really does. Let me just talk to my single friends that are here. Stop dating people with an agenda to get something. Stop dating people to hook up. Stop dating people to maybe have this emotional connection with somebody. Like, stop dating. Let me, let, me, let me put it this way. Stop dating just to get married. Date somebody to get to know them. That's why you should go on dates with people, so that you can get to know them. Not because there's all these strings and all this pressure and all these things that, like, I want this from you. Why? Because it's impossible to have a close, authentic relationship with someone from whom you're always trying to get something. Now, this principle applies to the church. And if it's okay, can I just say it like I feel like God told me to say it? Listen, if church is only about what you can get out of it, no church will ever be good enough. I love you enough to tell you the truth. And I say it with a smile on my face. If church is about what you can get out of it, I promise you no church will ever be enough. Like Jesus never described the church as a movie theater where you watch something and then critique it on the way out. Like, no, like Jesus described the church as a body that every single one of us are a part of. Like we're meant, we're made by God to be contributors, not just consumers. So if church is only about what you can get something out, of, something will always be off. With this church, another church, you can go to nine, 90 churches. There'll always be something missing. Because that is not how God designed this thing to be. Like you're going you're gonna to eventually be dissatisfied. And let me tell you, this principle also applies to God. That if you're only following God because of what you can get from him, you're missing the point. You're going to eventually be dissatisfied. Because, listen, God is relational, not transactional. And we are made in the image of God, by the way. And God is relational. Not, see, the point is not what we can get from God. The point is to have a relationship with God. Now, let me just say, there are some tremendous benefits 
from following God. And, and listen, we try to tell you all about those benefits, but the point isn't the benefits. The point is the relationship that you can have with God. In fact, listen to what Psalm 37 verse 4 says. It says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, here's what I want you to notice is the order. Notice the order of that verse. It's first delight and then he'll give you the desires. But I don't know about you, but so often in my relationship with God, I like to switch those two things. It's like, God, will you give me all the desires of my heart? And if you do, I will delight in you. But that's not what this says. The order is important. It's first, no, I'm going to delight in you. Why? Because you're a good God who I love, and I know your character and your nature. And if you don't do one thing for me the rest of my life, you've already done enough because of what you've done through Jesus. And so I take delight in you. And then why? Because he's a good dad. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because it's impossible to have a close, authentic relationship with someone from whom you're always trying to get something. Okay, I'll step off that box and let's get back to the the scripture. It says in verse three, it says, then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, and Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. And turning to Philip, who was one of his disciples, um, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to to do. And in the message paraphrase, it says, he said this to stretch Philip's faith. Um, I hate stretching. I hate stretching. Um, I'm, I'm not flexible at all, um, but I know I need to stretch. I, I, I hate stretching. But here's what I've learned about stretching is that stretching increases capacity. Like it allows for more. And um, sometimes I, I believe God will allow us to face certain things Because he wants to use that very thing to stretch us and increase our capacity, to increase our dependency on him, our desperation for God, our trust in God, maybe our character. He wants to stretch our character and our integrity, or maybe even our leadership and our influence. And so he said this to test Philip. And then Philip replied in verse 7, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then... Good old problem-solving Andrew. I like Andrew here. Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up. He said, there's a young boy here with a Lunchable uh, of five barley loaves and two fish. It's like, hey, we got this. Like, I like him. I like him. He's like, I don't know if this can do anything, but we got it. Then kind of reality sets in for him. But what good is, is that with this huge crowd? By the way, let me just say that I believe the what, like, one of the biggest miracles in the entire Bible, not just this story, but in this Bible, was that a young boy selflessly shared his food. <laughs> Where are my parents at? Come on, like, that is a miracle. That's like, oh, this selfless little boy is like, here you go. Like, you do that. <laughs> that would not be our children. Um, <laughs> and it says this in verse 10, it says, Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes, and the men alone numbered about 5,000. Now, most scholars believe that there was up to 20,000 people that were in attendance right here, right now, when you added all the women and the children, when you added up all the people. So my question is, why don't they say that? Because if I was, like, writing the Bible... And I was there, and the point of it was to tell the story of Jesus so that other people would follow him. You know what I would say? I would say 20,000 people were there. Like Jesus fed 20,000 people. Not Jesus fed 5,000 people, which is still cool. But for me to like pack a little bit extra punch, I would say, man, can you believe that Jesus fed fed 20,000 people? But it said, even. 5,000 men alone. Now, 
Why? I'll tell you that in just a moment. Here's what it says. Continue with the story. It says, then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and the other three accounts say that he gave the food back to the disciples, and then they were the ones who distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish. And here, here's, here's the miracle part right here. It says, and they all ate as much as they wanted, and everyone was full. And Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Jesus never wastes anything. Let me just go ahead and encourage you. If you're in a hard season right now, he will not waste it. It says, it says so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. So there's a whole bunch of leftovers. And when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, this miracle, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet that we have been expecting. See, because the Bible had already promised that there's a savior that's coming. So when they saw this miracle, they're like, hey, this is him. He is the promised savior. But for them... In that day, they weren't thinking about a spiritual savior. They were thinking about a military savior. See, they were thinking about somebody that was going to come in and organize the Jewish people so that they could overthrow the Roman government that were at the time in their country. And they're like saying, this is it. This is the one that's going to save us from all the Romans and save us from this Roman empire. And by the way, this is why it says 5,000 men and why it's so important because 5,000 men, get this, I nerded out over this this week, was the equivalent of a Roman military legion. So this would have been the start of his military army. He could have started with these 5,000 men and worked his way all the way south to Jerusalem. And when he worked his way south, they would be getting more and more people that would say, I want to be a part of what you're doing so that he could go down and overthrow the Roman government. And that's why it adds this, because it's saying this is what they expected and this is what he could have had. But that wasn't Jesus' assignment. See, his assignment was way bigger than that. His assignment was to save humanity from their sins, not the Romans. So this was Jesus' response. So they get so excited. They're like, this is it. This is, this is who we can follow. Oh, this is going to be the guy who's going to save us. He's going to save us militarily from this government that we don't like. And here's what it says. It says, when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king. That's a military leader, not a spiritual leader. He slipped away into the hills by himself because that wasn't his assignment. So what can we learn from this miracle? How does this apply to our life today? Because the reality is all of us in some way, in some area of our lives, like we're in need of God's provision. Maybe you need finances or resources Maybe you need a new job or you need that promotion. Maybe for you, like you just need friendships or, or, or maybe you're just lonely. Maybe I, I need friendships. I, I, I need, I have a desire for God to provide a spouse. Maybe you're married in here and you're trying to have a baby, but you can't have a baby. And so there's, there's parts of you that's like, God, would you please provide a baby? Maybe for you, it's like you need peace and you need comfort. There's so much that's going on in your emotions and your mind and your thoughts. And you just need peace and comfort. Maybe you need wisdom or clarity or direction or answers to something that's going on in your life. Maybe you just need courage or strength to do the things you know God is telling you to do. Maybe you need increased faith or trust in God. And whatever the situation is, how can we position ourselves to experience miraculous provision? Get this, either in a moment or in a process. And let me just go ahead and say this as we start this series. Both are miracles. 
either in a moment or a process. Thank you, God, that you would still change us. That is a miracle. And when I look at this miracle in John chapter 6, I see three things. Here's number one. I'm going to go through these fast. One, start with what you have. Start with what you have. In Mark's account, we just read it from, from, from John, but in Mark, here's what it says in Mark 6, verse 37 through 38. But Jesus said, you feed them with what they, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. I think about constantly what I don't have. And then he said, no, no, no. Don't think about what you don't have. How much bread do you have? Go and find out. And they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. See, Jesus said, start with what you have. Shift your focus from what you don't have to what you do have. And if you need God, let me just say, if you need God to provide in some way, let me encourage you today, start with what you have, not what you don't. And specifically, practically, here are two things that you can do. Here's two things that you can do. One is be thankful for what you have. Just be thankful. Be thankful for what you have. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Be thankful in all circumstances, on the good days, on the bad days, on the blah days, on everything in between. That includes when you got everything that you need and when you are in need. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, being thankful has a way of shifting our perspective. If you want to know God's will right here, be thankful for what you have. Instead of obsessing over what you don't have, be thankful for what you do have. The second very practical thing is one, be thankful for what you have, but then two, be faithful with what you have. Be faithful. Don't just be thankful. Be faithful in what you have. Jesus says so clearly in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But let me just say the reverse is true as well, that if you are not faithful with little things, you won't be faithful with big things. How do you expect to be entrusted with more in the future if you're not being faithful with what God has given you right now. So if you want more leadership, you want more influence, be faithful with the leadership and the influence that you have right now. If you want more resources, be faithful and be a good steward of the, re of the resources that you have now. If you want a better job, Come on, be faithful with the job that you have right now, and then a headhunter is going to come find you because you're doing a good job. If you want more relationships, you got to be faithful with the relationships that God has blessed you with right now. See, I'm convinced that being thankful and being faithful will unlock more in your life. I believe it. That will unlock miraculous provision in your life. But you have to start, number one, with what you have. Here's number two, give what you have to Jesus. So start with what you have, figure out what that is, and then two, give it all to Jesus. Like give what you have to Jesus. In Mark 6, 41, it says Jesus took, Jesus did, the five loaves and the two fish, looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. Now, here's what I notice. Here, here, here's what we have to see. Is that the miracle doesn't happen in their hands. The miracle happens in Jesus' hands. And here's what I see and here's what I've experienced after following Jesus now for 22 years, is that in our hands, we don't have enough. If you haven't learned that yet, you will. In our hands, we don't have enough. But thank you, God, that in Jesus' hands, we have more than enough. In our hands, we don't have enough. 
But in Jesus' hands, we have more than enough. So if you need miraculous provision, start with what you have, not what you don't. Focus on that. Be thankful. Be faithful. Figure out what you have. And then give whatever you have to Jesus. Like, stop trying to control the situation, which I'm guessing that you probably can't anyway. Because if you could have, you would have. Like you probably, I'm convinced that 99% of the anxiety that we, that we experience is trying to control something that we ultimately can't control. So stop trying to control the situation because you can't. You can't. Like take your hands off of it. Let it go. Give it fully to Jesus and trust him with it. Because the miracle, it doesn't happen in our hands. It happens in his So start with what you have, give what you have to Jesus, and then number three is this, do whatever he says. Do whatever he says. See, when you read through this miracle, in all four accounts, you see Jesus telling them exactly what to do, and then they do exactly what he says, and the result is miraculous provision. Not only do they feed everybody, but they feed everybody till they're full. And then they go around and they find 12 basketful of leftovers. And it all started with obedience. See, I'm convinced that God's love language is obedience. God's, God spells love O-B-E-Y. I'm convinced. John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, if you love me, obey my commandments. That order. If you love me, obey my commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says, true love for God means obeying his commands. You know, sometimes I wish the Bible was just easier to understand. <laughs> true love for God means obeying his commands, and his commands don't weigh us down as heavy burdens. See, obedience leads to blessing because God's ways are God's ways for a reason. They're always to make our life better, not worse. It's, it's, it's always to help, not to hurt. And I'm just going to say this, is that maybe right now your disobedience or your partial obedience is keeping you from experiencing miraculous provision right now. And maybe you want God to bless your finances, but you're not obeying God in tithing. Maybe you want God to bless you with a spouse, but you're not honoring God now with your sexuality and your purity. Maybe you want God to bless your marriage, but you're not taking the first step in asking for forgiveness. And you're asking, God, why won't you provide in this area? And I think God's saying, why won't you obey? Because your obedience will show that you're ready for that provision. See, I'm telling you, obedience leads to blessing. I've seen this so many times in my life, especially on my hard days. See, I, I, we've experienced this as a family when we face the diagnosis of our oldest son on the autism spectrum, where we have seen God miraculously provide in ways that I wish I had an hour to tell you all about. See, we've experienced that whenever we started this church and moved to Cincinnati knowing one family and nine months later started this church. And I'm telling you the whole story. There's a four-year process where we just experienced the miraculous provision of God that I'm telling you we're still experiencing today. I've, I've experienced that in obedience. It just leads to blessing. So if today you find yourself at church and you need miraculous provision... One, start with what you have. Like focus on what you have, not what you don't. Two, give what you have to Jesus. Like release control. Trust him with everything. Like don't just figure out what you got. Give it all to him. Because in our hands, we don't have enough. But in his hands, we have more than enough. And then three, just simply do whatever he tells you to do. Like obey whatever he asks. And watch what God does in your life. Watch 
how he provides. Watch how you experience miraculous provision. Now, 